all of our panelists. Uh, I would like to bring to the stage Mr. Vijay Rao from Facebook uh, to really bring the next piece of our conversation together. Vijay. <laughs> Awesome. Great energy in the room. Love the crowd. We have a lot of exciting news to share with you today. Let's give you a couple of seconds to settle down. I see a lot of people moving. Today we'll showcase how our infrastructure, software infrastructure, is evolving in conjunction with our hardware infrastructure to provide a more complete picture. You'll see this theme repeating throughout my presentation. Basically, what we are trying to show is how software and hardware are working together in harmony to give impact to Facebook. First, let's look at some large numbers. This one is not a Facebook statistic. That's roughly the number of humans we have on our planet today. It's a big number. And here is Facebook's mission. We aspire to build a platform that enables connections. And by connections, we don't mean just passive ones. We mean connections that are rich in engagement. And speaking of connecting people, here are our most recent user statistics on our platform. And these are some of the types of engagement that these users drive on our platform. Here are a few metrics that drive our infrastructure design. This scale and variety of engagement puts a lot of stress on our infrastructure. But that's what makes designing it fun. Let's see a short video. The x-axis represents compute growth over time. The y-axis represents storage growth over the same period. And the area of that circle, that represents the video growth. Our pivot to mobile first as a company gets pretty evident. You can see in late 2012, there's a big jump. So soon after that pivot, we saw that big jump in video growth. And now, as a company, we are pivoting towards a video first one. Need I say more? Our engineers do an excellent job in anticipating levels of engagement and provisioning capacity for this. But not all engagement can be planned for. These are a few engagement spikes that we saw just in Q4 2015. Let's look at its impact on designing our infrastructure. Here is a very, very, very large number. That's 14 zeros for those of you counting, and that's a Facebook statistic. That's our current web server capacity in instructions per second. Let that sink in. It's difficult to relate to such large numbers, so let's try this as an analogy. If humans could execute web server instructions, every human alive, including the baby born just now, would have to execute one million instructions every second. That's crazy. And that's how it feels. Our 10-year roadmap is focused on building the technology required to connect people through increasingly immersive experiences. And our infrastructure is evolving to support this. So how does all of this relate to OCP? Open hardware increases the pace of innovation. It makes it possible for everyone to work at the speed of software. As I said, you'll see the theme of hardware working in harmony with software. Unlocking software from hardware, that's a theme our community embraced strongly this year. In 2016, we opened our disaggregate lab. It provides our partners and solution providers a sandbox to innovate and develop new solutions on open hardware. Cumulus and SnapRoute, they provide network software solutions for OCP hardware. NetApp and IBM, they provide software-defined storage solutions on OCP gear. And finally, Canonical and Red Hat, they enable OpenStack and Linux operating systems and a lot more from their product portfolio to run on OCP gear. Please plan on attending the panel discussion later today to hear directly from these solution providers. 
Switching gears. That's a lot of stuff. This is what we've announced since OCP's inception. That's a lot of cool stuff over many, many years. And we have a number of announcements today, too. At Facebook, engineers can have any server they want as long as it's one of these. Each is optimized for a different bottleneck. Let's look at our updates today. Bryce Canyon, that's our major JBoard refresh since Knox. It supports more powerful processors and increased memory. It's a modular design. It's more thermally efficient and more power efficient. It provides a disaggregated storage capability with the ease of scalability. Both important things for us. This new platform will be used for high-density storage, including photos and videos. It provides 20% higher storage density than Knox. Let's look at our next one. Twin Lakes and Yosemite V2. These are our refreshes for Mono Lake and Yosemite. It's becoming a workhorse at Facebook. This one's really driving a lot of change within Facebook. Yosemite V2 is highly modular, allowing SOC carrier cards to be replaced with storage carrier cards or regular PCI carrier cards. All of these add functionalities that we didn't have in the previous version. There are a number of hidden gems that I just can't list all of them out here in this new design. Please check them out at our booth. And as promised, here's the accompanying software stack. Type 1 servers are designed specifically for our web server, which runs on HHVM. This is a very compute-intensive workload and an important component of our scale-out software stack. The application is stateless and perfect for scaling horizontally. Some history here. Many years ago, we had HipHop, which converted PHP to C++. It was a step up from what we had before, which is running native PHP, but we thought we could do better. So what did we do? Instead of compiling PHP to C++, HHVM compiles PHP into an intermediate bytecode. And then this bytecode is translated into machine code dynamically. This allows for a number of optimizations that cannot be made on a statically optimized binary. That's key. This enables higher performance for us. We've open sourced HHVM. So that's the theme of software working with hardware harmoniously. Tioga Pass, that's our next generation dual socket server. It supports single and double sided designs with back to back DIMMs. This maximizes the memory configuration, which is important for us. Let's look at the software stack corresponding to these servers. A few years ago, we moved many of our services from disk to flash. RocksDB then became an integral component of many of our services, and it's been growing rapidly. So what's RocksDB? It's a persistent key value store, and it's optimized for fast storage. It excels where the database instance is many times larger than the memory. We wanted to build a general purpose key value store that would solve a problem for the wider industry, not just Facebook. And of course, we've open sourced RocksDB too. Hardware and software working together. A few years ago, we embarked on an ambitious project of combining MySQL and RocksDB. We called it MyRox. MyRox is going to play a very key role in our hierarchical storage as well as disaggregated flash infrastructure. First, let's look at why we did this. What are some of the gains it provides us? Our current DB instances run on InnoDB. MyRox provides us 10x reduction in write amplification. And as you know, that's really important for flash, and we really like our flash. 2x compression and database size. That's huge for us. 45% increased QPS. That's a significant performance bump. Migrating for, from InnoDB to, to MyRox 
that reduced our storage requirements by 50%. Let that sink in. It also consolidated the number of instances, thus reducing the number of servers we need. In case you missed that 12, that's a 50% savings. Four years ago, we talked about disaggregation. We've made excellent progress since then. Two years ago, we shared efficiency wins with memory disaggregation on multi-feed. Since then, we deployed disaggregated Hadoop for hard drives. And here are the reasons we've turned our attention to disaggregating Flash. The first two are straightforward. So let's skip those and just let's look at the third reason, varying terabytes per server. You must have seen this slide in the next one a few years ago. I remember I saw it four years ago when Jason Taylor spoke about memory and CPU. Same concept here. Let's say we've designed a perfect SKU for service A. Now why not buy less flash for service B that resides in the same SKU? Well, customizing a SKU per service, that's a very, very slippery slope. Operationally, this becomes very cumbersome and very inefficient. It's a shortcut, but it's definitely leading to pain. Resource mismatch. That also occurs as a service evolves over the years. We need an infrastructure that allows flexible resource allocation. That's what disaggregating resources is all about. We added type 8 to our fleet to enable disaggregated flash and hierarchical storage. Direct attached storage forces flash and compute to scale in a fixed ratio. That makes it extremely inefficient. So we designed Lightning. That's our JBOF, or just a bunch of flash, to share flash across multiple servers. Tioga Pass, like we talked, is our compute resource, and Lightning is our disaggregated flash sled. Lightning shares the flash across the multiple servers. This allows each resource to scale independently. And that's two systems populated in one rack. This design lends itself to a flexible ratio of compute to storage. That's key. For engineers, it's really satisfying to see a design come alive. From an Excel spreadsheet to that was a lot of work. Here's a disaggregated flash rack serving production traffic. So we've got that in-house. We currently use a SATA-based flash sled, very similar to Lightning. So the rate at which our data sets are growing, tiering will become necessary and natural. Hierarchical storage improves efficiency. It improves scalability. We are working on a caching tier called persistent read cache. This works very closely with RocksDB. And it enhances our capabilities for hierarchical storage. Please check it out on GitHub. Of course, we've open sourced this one, too. Now let's change gears a little bit. Let's relook at our Facebook 10-year roadmap. We are committed to advancing the field of AI and its dis disciplines like machine learning, computer vision, and natural language processing. Tackling these complex problems requires close integration of hardware and software. We are pushing the boundaries of how we can help our users while simultaneously scaling out these technologies. In addition to the area shown here, we use AI to keep our users secure and to flag objectionable content on Facebook. Extremely important for us. AI, it isn't just a 10-year research project in some lab far away at Facebook. Facebook AI research and applied machine learning teams are two teams that are focused on this area right now. In addition to building AI in our data centers, we designed cafe to go That's a framework that runs on mobile phones. It runs neural networks on mobile phones, and it is built off cafe 2 It can execute neural networks in less than 1 20th of a second. We experiment daily with a number of deep learning models in our data center that require tremendous amount of compute power. An important area we use AI is for object recognition in our content. 
This provides for a richer experience to the 100 million plus visually impaired users on Facebook. Let's check this video out to see how this impacts our users. This image may contain six people, child, close up, like, one or more people, jewelry, smiling, 19 likes, three comments Aww. like. And now I can see the picture in my head, like, yeah, you shouldn't have been that close up. <laughs> like, now I can say it. Oh, I gotta love it. You have no idea. This is amazing. The whole saying of pictures being worth a thousand words, I... I think it's true, but unless you have somebody to describe it to you, even having like three words just helps flesh out all the details that I can't see. That makes me feel like included and like I'm a part of it too. I can just call my mom like, yay, I, I seen your picture. And she'll be like, what? She was like, how you see it? Because my phone read it to me. It's new. <laughs> I seen it. <laughs> Wow. Coming back to us, Big Sur was our first widely deployed AI and machine learning platform. This system was twice as fast as off-the-shelf systems that we used previously. It enabled researchers at Facebook to train networks twice as large and in half the amount of time as before. And now, meet Big Basin. That's a successor to Big Sur. It is modular, highly serviceable, and a disaggregated design. It incorporates NVIDIA's NVLink as well as its latest GPUs. We can now train 30% larger models and achieve 100% throughput improvement in image classification models like ResNet 50. Let's look at one more thing. Art typically exists in a museum, while true inspiration resides in you. We want to inspire the artist in you and have some fun. AI is not just for serious stuff. We also let you have fun. Let's see how we use AI to enable that. We want to use AI videos and our platform to take art out of the museum and place it in your hand. Style transfer allows you to stylize videos in real time. The breakthrough here is being able to train these models on a big server and deploy them on your pocket. Yep, AI is for fun too. In closing, don't limit your challenges. Challenge your limits. Today, we shared how our hardware and software are evolving together to create a more efficient infrastructure. We regularly challenge our engineers and partners to design disaggregated solutions built on innovative software infrastructure and upcoming hardware technologies. We continue our mission of increasing software and hardware flexibility and providing more choice in the user space. Server space, sorry. As you can see, there's a lot more to get done. We welcome you to join us on this journey. And like Mark says, our journey is just 1% finished. Thank you.